Hello and welcome to Mondo Street Social Club. Today I'm joined by author, comic writer, screenwriter, journalist and documentary maker, Lauren Bucas. Um, if you've got Apple TV, you may be aware of Lauren's work. Uh, she wrote the book Shining Girls, which the TV show is subsequently based upon. So without further ado, let's get in there. Hi Lauren, how are you tonight? I'm really good. I'm really looking forward to spring, please, any day now. <laughs> Something a bit warmer and a bit drier. Yes, please. Yeah, the, the weather has been fairly inclement recently. So welcome to the podcast, the, to The Social Club, um, a place where creative minds meet and learn from each other. Uh, thank you for coming on. So can we start off by just a little bit of an overview of how you got to where you are today? Oh, gosh, my entire career in like <laughs> oh. <laughs> not, not, maybe maybe your favorite bits sure um well, i've wanted to be a writer since i was five years old and i found out that that was a job that you could get paid for to make up yeah. stories yeah. um i've been really lucky to have that kind of you know as a guiding principle mm -hmm. um but yeah I, I wrote my first novel in 2005 which was moxie land um and then zoo city came out in sorry moxie Land came out in 2008 Zoo City came out in 2010, and that won the Arthur C. Clarke Award. Um, and so it's kind of weird, black, magic, noir set in Johannesburg. Um, and that just kind of, my career took off from there because I had a very good agent. He was actually my third agent, my fourth agent, um, which is advice we can get to later. But um, uh, he was like, "You listen, you've got the spotlight right now. You need to like make this work for you right now. In a year's time, it's going to be over because there'll be a new winner. Um, and I luckily I had an idea for like a novel about a time traveling serial killer and um, the survivor who turns the hunter around, which of course is a very sexy premise. It's the only one of my books that can be summed up in like three words. Um, the rest are way too complicated. Yeah. And um, yeah, my, my agent got a huge book deal for me. You know, there was like a six way bidding war. We sold the film rights. Uh, it was just absolutely amazing. And that suddenly allowed me to be, you know, I managed to pay off the house that I was living in with my then husband now ex and um uh and like become a full-time novelist and it was amazing um yeah and then i've yeah I've had a few books uh, two books since then as well and some short story collections some comics um and then the shiny girls came out on apple tv in 2022 um and that's just been like absolutely mind-blowing as well it's been mm. amazing yeah 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 one of the questions that um I've had some writers on, some authors and some screenwriters on previously. And one of the questions that came from one of them was, um, who was it now? Just bear with me a second. It was from Chris Tetrot Blay, who's a uh, horror writer from the south of England. And he said, how has your perception of, write of the writing world changed since becoming a writer? Now, you decided to be a writer at five. <laughs> so so, so your, your perception of the writing world at that, that age was, was quite rose-coloured, I suppose. Oh, definitely. You know, I was kind of going to be writing in my in my cottage in the garden and kind of just imagining beautiful things all day and just kind of like letting the fantasy, like the epic fantasy just flow through me. <laughs> um, and the reality is that it's hard and it's lonely and it's, did I mention hard? Because yeah. um, <laughs> you're, you're trying to hold together like a whole universe and like make sure that all these character strands uh, work together. And um you know, I'm definitely a headlights writer. I don't know if you're familiar with the term. No, I'm not, no. So the, you, there's plotters and pantsers. So plotters like plot everything beforehand. Pantsers fly by the seat of their pants. <laughs> and headlighters are somewhere in between. Um, okay. It actually comes from an E.L. Doctorow quote, right. uh, which I've quoted quite extensively, which is um, writing is like taking a drive at night. You know, or it's like taking a road trip at night. You know where you're leaving from, you know where you're going to, and the rest of the way you can just see 20 feet ahead of you in the headlights. And you're just <laughs> Um, and, and there are times when the headlights go out. Oh yeah. Or you like, yeah. you know, take an interesting detour and end up like, you know, being attacked by cannibals in the woods or <laughs> riding into a ditch and having to change a tire yeah. or end up on a much more interesting road. And you're like, oh, this is way more interesting. And I didn't realize that we were going this way, but I guess this is more, more fun. <laughs> I think that's really good. Cause I, cause I saw you, uh, show the picture of you when you were five on your Ted talk. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there you are sitting there, five year old, with a, a little pad and a pencil. And it's like, cool. From yeah. small beginnings, you know, mighty oaks grow. Or I'm sure I just misquoted that completely. Well, I mean, let's, I mean, I think I misquoted E.L. Doctor as well. So we're all good. Right. 
one all then. The one missed all. Yeah. <laughs> Let me go just go back to the Arthur C. Clarke Award because that was quite quick, wasn't it, within your career? Yeah. How did how did you keep your head on your shoulders when that happened? Oh God. So I mean I was I was completely overwhelmed. I mean I didn't I wasn't expecting it. Um I'd actually just put my I just put my speech away um yeah. when they when I think it was China Mebel like announced my name. Um but I was I was on a high for like days afterwards. I was like shaking, I was so nervous, like yeah. when they when I went up to the stage and it was just incredible, you know. And I think <sighs> You know, I, I often talk about this. I think getting to a short list is an indication of talent mm -hmm. um, and 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 the quality of the book. But I think the winner is often it's luck. You know, it depends who else you were up against that year. It depends what the judges are into. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe like there is a major theme in the world right now. And that's kind of something that, they're, that they the awards want to see reflected. Um, and oh, as it should be, you know, like an, an award should be like, you know, um, responding to the moment and responding to kind of where we are um but yeah no it was i i it was terrifying it was absolutely terrifying uh, <laughs> and i think that's the thing like i i have a lot of um uh very self-deprecating but i'm also very um not insecure uh full of self-doubt like okay. you know like I, I i i still have imposter syndrome six novels in mm. um so i still struggle to write i still put myself under ridiculous pressure, you know, where I am wanting to write the books that I read and I read it at like a really high level. I read really good books and really good authors. And you know what? I'm not Margaret Atwood and I'm never going to be, and that's okay. Yeah. But if I start writing and I'm holding myself to Margaret Atwood levels, like I'm just going to sabotage myself. You know, I have to hold yeah, myself cool. to hot mess levels and then kind of see what's <laughs> interesting. Yeah, it's, it's funny we're, we're forty odd episodes into this uh, into this podcast, and the the phrase that the phrase that repeats itself over and over again is imposter syndrome. Oh yeah, no, completely. I think, but yeah. I think that's also important because I think it kind of drives you. It does a little yeah. bit. Um, I was at I was at the Aridan Crime Festival in La Palma, which is in the Canary Islands, in January, and um, uh, it was really amazing. But there was a vol volcanic eruption there in twenty twenty one, so there's still just this giant swathe of kind of like black lava dried you know um cooled down lava all the way down to the ocean yeah. and um it just really made me think about like you know volcanoes as as a useful metaphor like you know you actually kind of need to like just kind of get it all out onto the page um <laughs> and then kind of sift through the rubble and see what you've got yeah, yeah. um but also you know seismic pressures that kind of create these incredible cliffs and this beautiful landscape um and this kind of very rich fertile soil and i think I think the pressure is important, but I think you have to be yeah. careful not to kind of blow yourself up for when I extend the volcano metaphor. Yeah, I, I think the thing is to is to manage the pressure as much as you can. Is to yeah. chop the expectations up into small pieces and say, yes, I can achieve that. No, I can't achieve that. It's funny That's you good. mentioned you mentioned Margaret Atwood then, who wrote The Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. Which which ties into Elizabeth Moss, which yep. ties into, <laughs> the, 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 that's that's quite good, that's uh, six degrees of separation. Yeah, um, two degrees, really. Okay, all right. I, I can't count and I can't quote. Um, <laughs> so that ties into The Shining Girls, your, your book which was adapted for Apple TV. Yeah. Which has been a massive hit. What was that, what was that like seeing somebody else take your source material, which, which is obviously something that you've, created and loved and, and birthed into the world for want of a different phrase um and take that and change it um yeah no i think i i, I sorry i heard somebody say this the other day i can't remember who it was so i'm just going to claim it as my own but it, mm -hmm. uh, they were talking about like you don't birth books you raise them like you raise children oh, right, okay. where it also again allows for that kind of subconscious stuff to happen in the book which isn't always kind of what you wanted or intended which yeah. i think is kind of the magic of writing mm -hmm. um uh, but yeah, no, it was incredible. Like I've, I've had a couple of, um, almost adaptations happen before. And, um, in one case, I just absolutely despised the director, uh, and writer who literally wrote over my script and took my name off it. Oh, um, no. and yeah, and luckily I got the rights back on that. And I, I, I recently yanked back the rights on something where I'd handpicked an amazing director who's also a writer, but they insisted on sticking with this other writer who I really i didn't like i didn't think that she understood what the story was at all yeah. um 
So, but it's nice to be in a position where you can actually like have that kind of control. But with Silka Louisa, who who adapted, she was the showrunner on The Shining Girls. So Silka yeah. Louisa was the showrunner on The Shining Girls. She wrote the most incredible adaptation. There are lines of dialogue that I wish I'd written. Um, the one character, Dan, is so much better than the character in the book. I hate to say it, but I think Wagner Moro and what he brings to the role is just like really interesting and really dynamic. Yeah, um, nice. Jamie Bell as kind of the incel, broken little jerk serial killer is perfect. He's absolutely immaculate. My fantastic. God. Yeah, he's absolutely fantastic. He's, and so chilling. And, yeah. and, Due credit to Jamie Bell, he always like gave a shout out to the novel in like all the interviews, which was amazing. Yeah. And then of course Elizabeth Moss just is just this incredible portrait of trauma. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very true to like the heart and the guts of the book, um, and I really appreciate that. And it's a beautiful prestige TV. Yeah. One of the things I miss is the sense of humor of the book. You know, I'm South African, and South Africans don't know if you know this, but we've been through mm -hmm. some stuff. Yeah. You know, colonialism, apartheid corrupt government, although the UK also has a corrupt government. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's uh, so so I think a lot of South Africans write and engage with the world with kind of quite a dark sense of humor, mm. because you have to because that's how you kind of get through. Um, and so the sense of humor was missing. And I understand, but I'm, I was kind of sad about that. Yeah, I saw on an interview you did that you, they asked you why it was set in Detroit. And you said, well, if you'd set it in South Africa, over that time period immediately would have become about apartheid. Absolutely. Sorry, Nothing, to correct you, no. it's, actually, it's actually set in Chicago. Sorry, Chicago. Yeah. 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 Rogue Monsters yeah. is set in Detroit and Chicago right. was the Shining Girls. Um, yeah. But yeah, it would have it would have had to become an apartheid story and it would have been, yeah. you know, if you're doing a time travel story in South Africa, yeah. you know, with the main character in the 90s, like, I'm sorry, you're going to have to try and overthrow apartheid, you know, yeah. like you don't have to go back and like overthrow apartheid. That's yeah. the only thing you can do. Um, but also, like, play, you know, sitting in America where I've lived, I um, don't know if you can hear in my accent. A little bit. Um, <laughs> but it, were, it meant that I could um, play with kind of a wider canvas and there and kind of look. I was also interested in, like, the loops of history, which isn't something which translated into the TV show. Okay. They, t they said it mostly now. Mm. Um, and then in Harper, the serial killer's time, like, kind of the 30s. Yeah. Um, but... Um, yeah, it allowed me to play with kind of the loops of history, you know, mm -hmm. and the things which come up again and again. And you think that we've learned from these mistakes and we haven't. So one of the shiny girls who gets killed is actually an abortionist working with a real life organization called Jane, yeah. um, which I, I read all the interviews and everything. And, and they provided humane abortions in like the 60s and 70s when it was illegal. Mm -hmm. um, and I put it in the book because, I, you know, we were arguing about women's rights to have like the right to choose um, uh, and to have control of your own body. Um, back when I was writing the book in like 2011, 2012. Um, but the fact that they've now reversed Roe versus Wade in the States is just mm -hmm. terrifying. So, oh. you know, the issues are the issues and they come up again and again. It was really interesting for me to be able to play with all those things yeah. in the book um, to look at kind of McCarthyism and how that's echoed by the war on terror and surveillance mm -hmm. society. Um, you know, what it's like to be queer uh, and kind of having to hide that. So, yeah, it was it was a really interesting way for me to kind of tell all those kind of different stories and touch on these different aspects of feminism and the female experience uh, throughout history. Mm. And, and, and the, the sum of all those parts comes together into a, a fantastic tale. And, and it, for me, it was Jamie Bell that stood out. Yeah, he's you know, amazing. Right? Because he's, amazing. He, he's, he's playing against type. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And, and he does it so well. Um it, yeah. He's also playing against type for how a lot of serial killers are depicted in TV yeah. shows and movies, even yeah. now, still, yeah. you know, where like a real serial killer, I did a lot of research. It's not, it's not my forte by any means, but a lot mm. of serial killers are, I'm going to try to avoid swearing, um, mm -hmm. but like broken little assholes, you know, yeah. like who are impotent, they feel impotent in their lives. They feel impotent sexually often. Um, and this is kind of their power move. And yeah. And they're, they're very broken. They're very feeling thwarted by the world and denied by women. And I think Jamie Bell just, that, that was the character I wrote. And Jamie Bell just absolutely inhabited that role and just yeah. really brought it to life of what a real serial killer looks like, which is not this debonair, sophisticated Hannibal Lecter or even kind of, you know, whatever. Like, it's just, it's just it was really good to like have a real serial killer kind of depiction where you yeah. just kind of you just despise him. And I think that's how we should feel about serial killers. The most interesting things about them is what the terrible things that they do to people. Mm. And it's not for any like deep psychological fascinating reason. It's because they're fundamentally broken. Yeah. Hollywood has a, has a habit of 
glor- to glamorize them, trying to make them part of the hero structure of the story. Absolutely. So, so that you actually, well, if you if you watch Silence of the Lambs, as great of a film that is, you do at parts root for Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, no, of course, yeah. absolutely, because it's and, fascinating. And that's the last thing you should be doing because of yeah. what, what he's done and what he's doing. Um, it's interesting because because when you're doing research on things like that, that, that must be very emotive for you. Yeah. Then, then you're writing your your interpretation of that into a character. So Christina Aglaratnam, and I'm sorry, Christina, I will re-record your surname again. I've got a chest infection. That's my excuse. Uh, she's a playwright in the UK. And she said, how do you unwind? You know, if you're writing very intense emotional scenes, how do you park that emotion at the end of that? Um, that's interesting. I, you know, because I do get very caught up, you know, because I think you should, you should, because you should be feeling all the feelings. Um, yeah. I think especially when you're writing from a point of view character, which, you know, Harper, the serial killer is, I mean, I, I write from the point of view of all my characters. It's, you know, it's either first person or close third. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it is, it's just poisonous. So, yeah. you know, I, I spend time with my kid. I, I, you know, I watch good TV. I read a book. I play really dumb games on my cell phone just online um might play zelda if i'm feeling better about you know (laughs) but yeah cell phone games are much easier um but yeah and just kind of like spend time with my friends but i also i i tend to write uh i I rent a studio space in dalston in east Uh, london and um so i'm usually around people so it's quite nice and like one of one of my uh people who's very in close proximity to me is my best friend, Sam Beck Bessinger, who's also a novelist. So she understands we can debrief and like, I can be like, oh my God, this is so exhausting. And like I'm in this really dark place and we'll go for a walk or we'll go for a cup of tea or something. Yeah. yeah. Did did I read somewhere that it's it's mixed creatives in that space? It is. Yeah, absolutely. It's really lovely. So there are animators and designers and artists and illustrators and a bunch of writers. Um, And yeah, it's it's just really nice. And it's very social and very communal. It's wonderful. That's a great a great way of working that because you've got people to bounce off that aren't in your field. Absolutely, definitely. And also yeah. just like to hear other people's, you know, the creative process is hard and mm-hmm. and it's really scary right now with AI, um, you know, AKA um, plagiarism engines. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. And, yeah, and, and to see the kind of struggles that everyone goes through and everyone's mm-hmm. struggling with deadlines or everyone's struggling to get clients or everyone's like, oh God, how am I going to finish this project? I'm feeling so stuck. Yeah. Um, it's just it's just good and then also just everyone's working really hard around you so you're like oh my god everyone's it's kind of a social pressure yeah um, you're like, oh yes i'm also working look, look. <laughs> the hive mentality work faster <laughs> yeah uh, matthew s robinson he's a, a writer director from los angeles was on the show he was on episode two of the show amazing and he said uh how do you env- envisage your characters when you're writing them in your mind do you do, you, do they have your face Oh no! Or, or do they? Or do you form a face for them? You know, do you, is it? Do you say like it's this is an Angelina Jolie type face? Um. Yeah, I might find I might collect images which kind of I feel gives a sense of the character, but I'm never doing specific casting. Right. Um. You know, it's, I think it's more about the attitude, and I actually don't go heavy on like the visual descriptions. I'm not. Okay. I guess I'm just not that interested in it. Yeah. Um. But yeah, no, I certainly don't envis- envis- envisage my face. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> a, um, whole, a whole book of characters of just looking like yourself. Oh, that, that would be yeah, would be a bit strange. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so if you could, if you could take um, part of the storyline from the Shining Girls, and you could time travel yourself, then yeah, go back ten years. Mm-hmm. Okay, is there a piece of advice that you, that you could give yourself? 10 years ago that would change who you are now for the better? I think I would have emigrated sooner. Um, okay. I would have gone into therapy sooner. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, if, if I had access to time travel, I'd definitely try to go back and kind of derail some of the capitalist stuff we yeah. have happening right now. Um, I don't know how good I would be at that. Um you know, you know what I really would have loved is to go back and go and tell my psychiatrist to give me an ADHD diagnosis because oh. I, only got, I only got diagnosed um, in December 2022, yeah. and and I've wasted a lot of my life with terrible symptoms, and I didn't have to. Um, so yeah. that would have been that would have been a major life changing thing I would have wanted to like do. Right. Do, do you think that 
not having the diagnosis for such a long period of your career, but having the symptoms and and do you think you would have been a different writer if you'd had an earlier diagnosis? Um, yeah, I, I definitely think so. I think I would have been able to get more done. Ah, um, yeah. And I know, you know, I know I have six novels, but I've been publishing since 2005. So it's yeah. almost, it's almost 20 years. Like I could have written a lot more than that. Mm. Um, and I think there would have been less, you know, like it's, uh, there, there, there are comorbidities attached, which is anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been incredible to me to suddenly, you know, like trying to get meds through the NHS and maybe there's a couple of days delay where I'm not able to get my meds and just suddenly have the anxiety coming back. And I'm like, how did I live like this? Like there was kind of barbed wire in my chest or like that electrical, mm -hmm. you know, if you walk past an electric fence and it's just ticking yeah. and that kind of constant tick, I'm like, I lived my entire life like this completely unnecessarily. This is insane. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I would have been, I think I would have got more done. I think there would have been less uh, like, less kind of, you know, I mean, the imposter syndrome and then not being able to do all the things I want to do can lead to self-loathing and that's not a nice place to be in. No, no, you know? not, at all. Um, not at all. Which is, uh, you know, and I think a lot of writers struggle, struggle with this kind of, and of course, you know, ADHD is a spectrum and of course we all struggle with mm. various aspects of everything and starting is hard for everyone, but it's, um, it's been amazing for me to see how much the medication makes a difference in my life and also how much I was trying to self-medicate by drinking eight cups of coffee a day, yeah. you know, um, and doing all these things where I was like desperately trying to like get my brain to work the only way I needed it to. Yeah. And, and having a diagnosis doesn't just mean like having access to meds, which is incredible. Oh. Um, but it means being handed a manual for your brain. Yeah. You know, this is, these are the ways your brain is strange and wonderful and incredible. Mm -hmm. And these are the ways your brain is going to kick you in the teeth and make your life difficult. Yeah. And just place this wire here and that wire there. And then when it does that, you know why it's doing it. So you know Absolutely. How, to, how to counteract it. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's still, I mean, it's still, you know, it's not like I'd have like the whole, you know, uh, schematics. It's, mm. uh, you know, it's still, still messy human lives, but yeah. 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 Okay. So which of, which of your stories then so far, would you say has been the closest reflection of yourself? Is there a character where you've written it and gone, Oh no, I just need to come a little bit away from that. Um, no, I think like all my characters are very close to me in different ways, you know, like my serial killers are also close to me because you, you know, when you're writing it again, it's an act of empathy. Like you're taking, you're taking a seed of something inside yourself and you're germinating it and like growing it into a tree. And, you know, with, with Harper, the serial killer and the shiny girls, that's kind of like this, just this very bleak cynicism. Um, and, and I have that inside me, you know, like that's absolutely part of me. Um, but it, it doesn't come out in kind of normal conversation or normal life or anything else. So it is, I mean, but I think that, you know, so Zoo City is probably my favorite book just because it was kind of rough and punk and, and strange and ambitious. And, you know, I hadn't won awards or had Stephen King or, or you know, amazing George R. R. Martin and people praising me. So it just felt like it was, I was really trying to prove myself and it was a, you know, a big F you attitude that I was just kind of like, I'm going to make it and, and do really well. And, and now, yeah, I wish I could, I wish I could get back to that younger self of like, kind of like just being like ambitious and brave and not understanding all the complexities of the entire industry and everything else. So it's just kind of this young punk writer trying to prove herself was a pretty fun time, but also, you know, it's a love letter to the city I grew up, grew up in and it's a love letter to South Africa. Yeah. When you, when you get your awards, we've spoken about how your respondents will get your awards, but when you get your peers saying such wonderful things about you, how does that feel? Oh no, I just, it's just, it's not real. It's not real. <laughs> Does it just go woo? Yeah, no, I can't, I literally can't pay attention to it because it's just going to, it's just going to scare the hell out of me. And, and maybe that sounds really arrogant, but it's just, it's just too much to compute. You know, when I, I think I was in Australia, I was super jet lagged. I was on book tour and Stephen King tweeted something about the shiny girls and everybody was like congratulating me. And I was like, I, this is obviously like some kind of horrible elaborate prank and I'm just going to ignore it. Um, and, it, and it just doesn't feel real. Um, and, it, and it wasn't an elaborate plank. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I know. He, he wrote genuinely about you, which is uh, absolutely incredible because to actually be able to get above the radar of people who are, you know, they're, they're superstars in the field. Oh, God, absolutely. To get, to get onto that radar is a significant achievement. You know, yeah, thank you. No, it is. Yeah, awards are looking for somebody to give an award to, aren't they? They're going, yes, we must find something. Somebody like, you know, Stephen King isn't looking for you. He, you went to him and he went, yeah. wow. 
And when he says that, I don't know, I don't know how many books he sells, something like 400 million copies. Something yeah, like no, that. completely. No, it's yeah. it's wild. It's really amazing. And also, you know, but it's also incredible to like be in the position where yeah, I can give that back. Um, hmm. Not that I'm Stephen King, yeah. but, you know, like being able to recommend other young writers or, you know, I've, I've set up a couple of people with agents. Please, no strangers should email me asking for that. Oh, no. I do not know you. I do not know your writing. I cannot help you. I am not a Stargate. Yeah. Um, and, but yeah, but being able to help people whose work I have seen, who people I know, people who I'm able to kind of, um, you know, recommend them to someone or, you know, I just, I just wrote a review in the New York Times for a young South African writer who I haven't met, um, yeah. which is important. The New York Times is like, you know, you need to have no existing relationship. Yeah. Um, but her book was wonderful, you know, and I think it's going to be the start of this massive career. It was really beautiful. Her name's Shabnam Khan and it's called um, uh, The Gin Waits 100 Years. And it's this kind of haunted house story, which takes place in the 1930s and 2014 with kind of Indian immigrants in South Africa and this elaborate mansion, which is kind of now falling to rot and ruin. Wow. Um, and there's this weird love story, which happened in the thirties, which has kind of just pervaded the whole house. And it's just, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so after, you know, after the, after the review came out, she emailed me and just, you know, like, and it was just really nice. Like actually be like, oh yes, this actually does mean a lot to people. Yeah. Um, and and it is nice to be able to pay it forward in kind of small and interesting ways. Yeah, it's really yeah. good that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like paying it forward and sideways and in all directions. Exactly. Yeah. Has there been a, a single life event that is, you, you've got success, okay? You've got critical cl acclaim and you've got commercial success. But has there been something in your life that has affirmed that this was the right decision for you? <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, I'm just laughing because I don't think I'm qualified to do anything else at this point. <laughs> you know, I think, I think just, uh, it was recently winning the Artsy Clark award. It was such an incredible moment in my life. It was just yeah. really amazing. And yeah, we were super broke. My friends had to have a fundraiser to be able to pay for my 8,000 Rand tickets. So, you know, I guess wow. probably like a 200 quid ticket to, to London. Wow. And I, cause I didn't have it. I just yeah, didn't yeah. have, it. um, and then I won the award and it changed my career and it was just absolutely incredible. So yeah. that was really, it was really amazing. And I remember just being on this high for like days afterwards. Yeah. Also very hungover after the, the ceremony. <laughs> um, there were a lot of drinks being bought. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but just this incredible sense of gratitude and like, and it was this amazing high and I, I've never really lost that sense of it. I think the other moment which stands out to me is I've had it happen a couple of times, um, probably five or six times now. Okay. Where a woman usually always uh, will come up to me usually at the end of a reading or at the end of an event once in a bar um, and said, I read the shiny girls and the way something happened to me and she'll, she'll never tell me what it is, which yeah. is fine. That's not the point, but she said, yeah. something happens to me, happened to me. And the way you wrote about it was right. You wrote about it in a way that reflects kind of the experience and what I went through. And, and that means more to me than uh, forgive me, Stephen King, but Stephen mm -hmm. King, you yeah. know, the fact that I wrote something, true yeah you know that it's completely fictional but it resonates with people and it's about it's about violence you know something which is really close to my heart about violence against women and yeah. and how we live with it and what trauma yeah. does to us yeah um, so that that was really amazing yeah and and the actual um the the uh the way that people responded to bridge your, your re most recent release that's been out of this world as well, hasn't it? It's it's just been like people are just being grabbing it, going woof. Because some of the uh, some some of the critics, you know, the, the actual just the the short. I'm used, I'm losing the ability to talk here. I do apologise. <laughs> but some of, the, some of the snippets are just saying, you know, this is such a, a really great book. It's it races along at a heck of a pace and just grabs you and drags you into the story. Isn't it great that you've gone and written something else, and people are still loving your work? Yeah, no, it, it is really amazing. It's incredible. I feel really grateful. Um, you know, there's so much hard work and I have an amazing editor who I work with in South Africa called Helen Moffat, yeah. who's kind of my development editor and I pay her separately to work with me. Right. Um, and it was, it was a hell of a thing because, you know, I was writing it while I was moving countries. I was writing it while Helen was in the throes of like really bad long COVID, which she's had since March, 2020. Wow. And you know, it just happened that the final edits were in a, in a time when she was actually feeling okay and was actually able to do it. So it was a lot of, you know, it was a, quite a painful process to like get yeah. there, but it's a really fun book. I really love it. It's really weird. 
Um, mm. it's definitely one of my weirder books, this kind of alternate realities and a dream worm that lets you switch between them. I was, was going to talk about that, about the parasites and the, yes. the, the tagline in an alternate world, there is uh, an exact double of yourself who's already got everything you've ever wanted. Yeah. I'm like, okay, can I swap places then, please? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. No. And, and you know, uh, it's, a t it's not really a spoiler, but it's like a little tiny detail. It's like an Easter egg, which is that, you know, as you're reading the book, like you begin to realize that the world that the story's taking place in is actually not our world. You know, they don't have, um, they didn't have Trump. Their COVID was kind of fixed in a very short time. Yeah. I'm like I'm definitely in the wrong timeline. How do I get to that one? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say yeah. If 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 there's a timeline without Trump, um, oh my god, I'll take a one way ticket there, please. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but yeah, but I think I think what was really interesting for me about that book was kind of the choices we make, and mm. I think that's I, I I finished it and then I got my ADHD diagnosis, and I was like, oh, I was basically writing about ADHD, you know, oh, and like right, being yeah. Yeah. paralyzed by like all these choices and all these alternate versions that you might have had, and also you know I've had quite a long and varied career. I've worked in kids animation. I've worked as a journalist. I've made documentaries, yeah. you know, um, and I, th I think that's very much kind of like playing in all these areas. Mm. Um, but it's also interesting because of course that other perfect mother daughter, um, alternate universe story, everything everywhere all at once, yeah. uh, is also an ADHD kind of metaphor, but that was knowingly so, yeah. and mine was not. Yeah. 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 I I'm one of the few people I know that didn't enjoy that film at all. <gasps> oh no, I loved it. I was so glad I finished writing the book when it came out because I would have walked away. I would have been like, okay, well, forget it. Yeah, it, it, it's really strange. So, sometimes films don't don't sure. connect with me. Um, it was beautifully shot, beautifully written, mm. performed, just didn't connect with me. And everybody I know to a person has gone, what? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, just at some point I'll watch it again and I'll go, I was so wrong. Or I still don't like it and that's okay. Yeah. Either way, yeah. fine with me. Okay. Is there a song or a film that would sum you up? Oh God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't no, think so. No. 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 Um, I think there are too many different things that I'd listen to and, and different films. Yeah. Um, I think if I had to be a TV show, it would be BoJack Horseman. The pathos and like the incredible like connection with humanity, but the quite you know it's very dark and it's quite sad. Yeah. Um, often. But it's also very funny mm. and very strange and and silly and um, bizarre. Yeah. And I think I think that's probably my favorite TV show ever made. And I think that's kind of I don't know if it's an accurate reflection of me. Maybe Search Party because it's just so weird and it just kind of keeps changing. I don't know if you've seen it. I haven't. No. It's an amazing show. It's on BBC. I finally got to finish watching it. It's kind of a sleeper hit. Like nobody really knows about it. Okay. Um, and I couldn't find a way to watch it in South Africa. I managed to watch three seasons and then just there was no way to get it. You can't buy it. You can't do anything. Yeah. But it start, the first season starts out kind of quite true crimey, um, yeah. where Alia Shawcats from um, Arrested Development is playing a, a young woman who becomes obsessed with missing classmates. And it's right. kind of like, a, you know, kind of a gone girl, true crime kind of missing persons case. Yeah. And then the second season goes bonkers. And then the third season escalates that. And the fourth season escalates it even more. And the, by the fifth season, it's completely wild. And you're like, how did you get here? No, actually, I can, I can absolutely see how you got here. Because this, this character arc has been there from the beginning. Of course, this character yeah. would end up in this situation where she's essentially causing the apocalypse. Um, right. Yeah. I, rec I recognize the, uh, the lead. Yeah. yeah. It's it's absolutely wonderful it's so well written all the characters are jerks but in a in a, in a kind of a lovable way um yeah. in a bojacky kind of way i guess yeah, yeah. and I, I think maybe that would be it that i just want to like i just want to keep i would i want to keep shifting things up mm -hmm. and changing and evolving and going to places that you wouldn't have expected but it makes sense when you look back at my career yeah and be yeah. like oh yes of course this makes <laughs> sense bridges is there now um hopefully we've got the parasites out of the system a little bit <laughs> um what's next on the on the menu for you um i'm adapting a tv show of, uh, from a short story that i co-wrote with my friends uh dale halverson and sam beck bessinger um so we're working with bad wolf uh who of course made killing eve and yeah, stuff. Yeah. um i don't think i'm allowed to talk much about it but that's kind of where we're at yeah that's, um, that's fantastic that's pretty exciting um and then I also, I've got to get started on a new novel. I have two ideas. I'm trying to figure out which which one to go for. Um, 
and I mean, I have, I have actually a, a huge folder of ideas, but mm. I need to kind of, these are the two ones I think would be most interesting to kind of settle in on. Yeah. I also have a comic I want to write. I've got a zombie shark m movie I want to write, which no <laughs> one wants to pay money for. I'm like, please just let me write my zombie shark movie. <laughs> yeah, please. We love that. I know. Yeah. yeah. It's been really interesting because I'm not a beats writer. Like I can't, I cannot work from beats. Yeah. It makes me die inside. Yeah. Um, and whether that's like, again, the ADHD brain or just the way my brain is, you know, it just, it just feels dead in the water. It's, uh, you know, if we're going to go back to the headlights analogy, um, it's like just being on a very, very long straight highway, um, or that it was that truck simulator where you could like drive a truck for like 400 hours or whatever. Yeah, why? Um, yeah, no, completely. And, and I want to be able to go off road and I want to be able to kind of see where this path takes me or a line of dialogue, which makes me think differently about things. Mm. And I, I really need to write intuitively. Yeah. Um, and beats just makes it creates a dead thing for me. It's just a yeah, dead yeah. animal on the ground. Um, which is not to say I can't work to structure or like kind of I know I still know what the major plot points are, but I need to get there in my own way. I can't be like this, and this and then this. I'm like, it needs to come through in the writing. Yeah, because because I, I read a quote from you saying that you when you have a character, you know their beginning and their end. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's something that, cause I, cause I write a lot of music yeah. and, I, and I like to think that I know the beginning and the end, but the end is always somewhere else by the time I yeah. get to it. Which is, which, which is what I find it like mag magical. And like, I have changed my endings before, you know, I kind yeah. of, I'm, I don't say like, I know exactly what the ending is. I kind of have a sense of this is where we're going right, yeah. you know, this is what needs to happen. Um, but it's, figuring stuff out along the way. And then also the subconscious magic of writing where, um, details emerge, you know, the book is smarter than the writer, mm -hmm. you know, because you're, you're writing into this thing and you're trying to hold it together. And there are subconscious things which kind of emerge from the depths and it's really beautiful and amazing to see that and be like, Oh, that's what I was doing all along. It was there all along. Thank God. Like, you know, yeah. somebody knew what they were doing. Cause it wasn't me. <laughs> that's really good. That. I suppose it's a bit of a, a cheeky ripoff question. This perfect. You're going on a desert island. Mm -hmm. You're only allowed five books. Mm. Uh, a Monster Calls by Patrick Ness. I was uh, the judge on the Kitchies Prize when he won that year, um, and I was yeah. I think we, we were all it was we were all loved it completely. Yeah. But it's just it's a book about what storytelling is and what it does to us, mm -hmm. and it's just so incredibly beautiful. Unfortunately, at this point, we did have some technical issues and lost the last of uh, Lauren's four books there. Um, I'd just like to thank Lauren for being so generous with her time, uh, for being so entertaining in the podcast. Uh, you can find Lauren at laurenbuerquez.com, uh, plenty on there, uh, and on Instagram, uh, same name, uh, at Lauren Buerquez. Uh, thank you very much. Apologies again for missing the last four minutes, but hopefully you got a really good feel of, uh, Lauren's work from the uh, 37 minutes we spent together. Take care.